Okay, welcome back everyone. So in the last video, we were looking at various different ways of separating the dynamically available and the quasi permissionless settings. Uh, and then the, the last thing I want to do is to look at uh, an I square separating the quasi permissionless and permission settings. Okay. In order to do that, we're going to re-examine uh, our definition of what it means for the adversary to be row bounded. Okay, so let's do that next. So let's recall our earlier definition. Okay. So we say an execution of a protocol is row bounded if it satisfies uh, the conditions laid out here. This first bullet point here is just related to um, <coughs> external resources. So I'm not worried about that for now. I'm really interested in the aspect of the definition which relates to the proof of stake. Okay, the assumption we made was basically that among active players, Byzantine players never control more than a row fraction of the stake. Uh, and as I suggested earlier on, in some ways, this is sort of, uh, a funny definition to make um, because it's really it's as much a uh, condition on the protocol as it, as it is on the execute the transactions issued by the environment, right? right so why is this a reasonable assumption? Why why can we assume that this is true uh, for any uh, arbitrary protocol? Right? In particular, you know, what, what would happen if we had some strange protocol that you know, purposely tries to finalize to, to confirm Byzantine transactions, for example? So we wrote this definition down basically because you know that's the way people normally think about things, but it's interesting to to examine this further. Okay, so to examine it a bit more, let's start by thinking about why proof of work protocols can't be live and consistent in the partial synchrony model. Okay, that might not initially sound relevant, but you'll see that it is in a second. Okay, so in particular, what goes wrong with Bizcoin or with Hybrid or Solida? Right, so we previously we considered this sort of generic form of a, a, a proof of work protocol, a BFT, well, a proof of work protocol that sort of integrates BFT style protocols in the following, following way. Okay, so you need to think about a, a proof of work protocol, <coughs> which we start with the genesis block that specifies an initial committee. Then once a committee is selected, they carry out a classical BFT style permissioned protocol for a while, right, in order to implement the next consensus decision. That consensus decision includes the next sequence of transactions to be committed to the blockchain, as well as determining which players have provided sufficient proof of work in the meantime for inclusion in, in the next committee. Right? And then we just repeat this process. That committee then carries out the BFT style protocol to determine the next sequence of transactions and the next committee and so on. Okay, so we just have this rolling sequence of committees. Each one just carries out this classical BFT style protocol. Now it's interesting to ask here, right, so why, what, what, goes, what goes wrong if we try uh, executing, uh, such a, using such a protocol in partial synchrony? Yeah, on the face of it, it seems like it might, you know, maybe it should be fine, right? Because BFT style protocols can certainly be live and consistent in partial synchrony. Okay, and all we're doing here is we're just you know, we're executing one uh, BFT style protocol uh, after another, right? So what, what can go wrong? Well, what goes wrong is that the proof of work produced by honest players might not make its way to the blockchain during a network partition, right? So maybe the honest guys are producing lots of proof of work but if we don't hear about it, and if we only hear from the, the, about proof of work produced by Byzantine players, then we might end up with committees that have Byzantine majorities. Okay, so then it becomes a natural question. Well, actually, can something similar happen with proof of stake? Okay, our previous definition basically just assumed it didn't, but could something uh, similar happen? And the basic answer is yes. Okay, so let's see why. Let's see a simple example that shows you the sort of thing that can happen. Okay, so I'm going to consider the example of what I call the payment circle. Okay, so we're going to consider a set of n players, p0 up to pn minus 1. I want to imagine p0 is Byzantine and the rest are honest, each with a single unit of stake. So everybody's starting off with a single unit of stake. So we start off in a situation where the Byzantine, the end, the adversary, controls 1 over n of the total stake. Now we imagine that in each of n consecutive rounds, each player pi just authorizes a new transfer for a single unit of stake from pi to pi plus one mod n. So the, basically the stake is just passed around the circle. Right? Nothing really changes. Yeah? Each unit of stake is just passed to the next player in line so that everybody still has one unit of stake. Okay, that's n squared transactions overall because we've got n in each round and we're considering n rounds. Yeah, as I just pointed out before, so each round of transactions leaves everyone's stake unaffected. Right? Each, each player still controls one unit of stake. So the set of transactions T allocates the adversary still a single unit of stake, one over N of the total stake. 
Okay, but then the question is, can we extract you know, some subset of that, those transactions which allocate the adversary more than one over in the stake? And yes, we certainly can. So now choose two T prime to contain the first I transactions issued by player PI. Okay, that's basically just enough transactions to get that unit of stake to P0, our Byzantine player. Okay, this then is a valid set of transactions. Okay, but if you think it through, if you consider this set of transactions T prime, this gives the player P0, the Byzantine player, all N units of stake. Okay, so the set of transactions T just ends, ends up giving everybody, ends up with everybody having uh, one unit of stake. The, the adversary owns one over N of the total stake. We take this subset T prime, okay, now the adversary owns all the stake. Okay, so what does this mean then for proof of stake protocols? Okay, well, I'm going to say that's a rough form of a theorem here, and then we'll make it a bit more precise later on. So basically, if we drop the assumption that the adversary is row bounded, and assume instead only that the set of all transactions issued by the environment allocates the adversary and most of row fraction of the stake, then proof of stake protocols cannot be row resilient in partial synchrony for any row greater than zero. Basically, we can't deal with any, any size of adversaries more than zero in partial synchrony in that case. Okay, so that's a, that's a rough form of the theorem. Let's, let's uh, go through uh, the details a little bit more. Um, okay, so a slight complication here is we can't actually directly impose requirements on the state distribution resulting from the set of transactions, the set of all transactions issued by the environment. Basically, because that set may not be valid relative to the initial state distribution. We're allowing that the environment can issue you know, pairs of transactions that are not um, consistent with each other. Okay, so instead we impose a requirement on every maximal valid subset of the transactions issued by the environment up until you know, any given time slot. Okay, let me do that in the obvious way. Okay, so formally we're going to say T is a maximal valid set of transactions at some time slot T. If it's a valid set of transactions relative to the initial state distribution. If every transaction in that set T is received by at least one honest player from the environment at some time slot less than or equal to T, and that's just a sort of technical condition, if you like, basically we're only, we're only really caring about transactions once they're passed to honest players. Okay. And then the third condition is what makes it maximal. So no proper superset of T satisfying 1 and 2 is valid relative to the initial state distribution. Okay, so that's just the sort of obvious definition, I'd say. Okay, and then it's called an environment maximally row bounded with respect to the initial state distribution. Uh, and it satisfies the following two conditions. So the first condition here is just a sort of technical condition that says we only really care about transactions once they're passed to honest players. Okay, they don't matter until some honest player has seen them. And the second condition is the, is the important one, really. So it says for every time slot T and every set of transactions T, which is a maximal valid set of transactions at that time slot T, okay, that set of transactions allocates Byzantine players and most a row fraction of the stake. And so basically maximal valid sets of transactions allocate the adversary and most of row fraction of the stake. Okay, so this is now a condition on the transactions issued by the environment rather than the protocol. Okay, so now here is the, the resulting theorem, the, the sort of more precise version of the, the approximate version that I showed you just before. Okay, so consider the quasi-permissionless authenticated, just means we have a signature scheme available, and partially synchronous setting. For every row greater than zero, there is no blockchain protocol that uses a reactive set of on-chain resources and satisfies consistency and liveness with respect to an externally row-bounded adversary and a maximally row-bounded environment. Okay. Okay, so this gives us uh, a, a separation between the quasi-permissionless and the permission setting. And as we said before here, you know, it's not surprising that we had to consider reactive sets of resources in order to, to get such a separation. Okay, so in some sense that might sound like bad news. In fact, we, we, we can deal with this issue. Okay, uh, so what was the basic problem then? Well, the problem with the payment circle is really that we have these sort of nested sequences of transactions, right, p p passing the unit of stake around the circle. And the players are, in particular honest players, are issuing uh, transactions in these nested sequences before uh, the previous uh, elements of the sequence are, have already been finalized. Okay, so what we can, what we, what we can do is we, we can show that um, you know, things won't be so problematic, basically, if honest players wait to finalize transactions um, 
they, they, they wait for, you know, before if, uh, issuing a transaction TR, we basically have to wait for all transactions that TR relies on to be valid, to be finalized. Okay, so here's a rough form of the theorem. And you know, obviously I invite you to, to look at the paper to see the precise version. So basically this stops being an issue in the UTXO model, right? this is the UTXO model of Bitcoin. If no honest player issues any transaction TR until all transactions required for TR to be valid are already confirmed. Okay, good. So that's, uh, that's everything I'm going to go through in this sequence of videos. Uh, I very much hope you enjoyed it. Bye-bye.